Tishbaav is a fast day. It is a day of mourning. It is a day where in the typical synagogue, the windows will be blacked out. You will find people sitting on the floor or sitting on low stools. The purpose for that is to remind us of the humility of repentance. The humility of repentance. Repentance is not about saying how bad I was. It's about saying what my behavior cost and recognizing the cost. It's not just I've been a bad boy attitude. It's not just a I'm sorry attitude. It's an acknowledgement of the full cost of our behavior. And when we look at the cost of the sin, if we look at what sin costs us, and I don't know about you, but there are times I look around and I get extremely discouraged because of the cost of sin. When someone asks me, why did that child get cancer? Why did this bad thing happen? Why did this person have to die in that car accident? Why did, and sometimes we look at it and we, real, we think there are no answers. But the answer is pretty simple. We live in a fallen world. We live in a world that is polluted by sin. We live in a world where other people's choices are going to affect me. Just as my choices affect the person next to me. So no, that child did no wrong. That child did not deserve what happened to them. It's not about which individual, which one, who... How, whose fault is it anyway? And I think that sometimes we really get stuck in that. <laughs> whose fault is it? Well, guess what? It's all of our fault. It's a community. The destruction of the temple was because the community sinned. The community. The whole. The rabbis tell us that the first temple was destroyed primarily because of idolatry. Because of idolatry, the worship of false gods and the bringing of idols into the city of Yerushalayim and even into the temple court. They will tell you they believe the temple was destroyed the second time because of a sin they call baseless hatred, meaning... I hated my brother without cause, without reason, just because. The house of Hillel, the house of Shammai, the factions that developed within Jerusalem, within Israel, that were coming to a head at the time of Messiah, that Yeshua came into the world of baseless hatred. The Pharisees hated him for no reason, right? Right? At least that group of Pharisees did. Those who were in leadership in Judea hated him. There were others who did not. That's why we have disciples. That's how come we have the first, the early church being made up of Jews, of people who followed Messiah. They didn't hate him. They loved him. But throughout the land, there was a baseless hatred brother against brother, turning each other into the Roman, arguing with each other, blaming everybody but themselves. And when the Bar Kokhba rebellion came and took place and people set them up to fail because they hated them, 
and subsequently Rome came along and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, not leaving one stone upon another. It was because they hated the one that God sent. Baseless hatred. Idolatry cost them 70 years. 70 years. Look at how many years baseless hatred has cost. I think we need to learn from that. We need to cry out for the temple of God.
And that's a little dry. Clean hands, pure heart. Or give us clean hands, I'm not sure which it's under.
favorite passages in the scripture is the passage um, at the end of Habakkuk where God has given Habakkuk the vision of judgment and Habakkuk comes before him and says but Lord you have also made these other promises and God again gives Habakkuk a vision of judgment but Lord, you've made these other promises. And God again gives him a vision of judgment. And Habakkuk, like Jeremiah, cries. And he weeps for the people. And he weeps for what he sees happen around him. He weeps for the cost. He weeps for the people. And at the very end of Habakkuk, he makes a statement that I think is very powerful. Even if there is no, I got to open it and read it right from there. I mean, like, I can't do it without it, you know? Habakkuk. It's in Habakkuk chapter 3. Verse 17, though the fig tree does not blossom, there is no yield on the vine. Though the olive crop fail and the fields produce no food. Though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no cattle in the stall. Yet I will triumph in Adonai. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Adonai, my Lord, is my strength. He has made my feet like a deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high places. And it ends with, this is for the choir director to be played on the stringed instruments. <laughs> even though there's certain destruction, even though there's nothing to eat. Even though I will bless the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name.
tasted that good. You know, dance is another form of prayer, right? We're coming to the end of the day of mourning, the day of fasting. And um, there's food there ready for us to break fast, but it's not time yet. It's still light out, right? Now, if we were in Israel, it would be done. We would be enjoying our feast already. <laughs> but we're not in Israel. We're here. And um, maybe that's worth mourning enough, right? <laughs> not in Jerusalem yet. But this is a season, and we are coming to the end of a season. From Tammuz 17 to the 9th of Av, Tisha B'Av, it's a season of rebuke, a season of judgment, a season of anniversaries of things that are not happy. But along with the rebuke, there is always consolation for the repentant. Today is the import, most important anniversary of this season. It's observed throughout Israel, throughout the world, with fasting, with prayers. The book of Jeremiah is read. Jeremiah is a book that tells us about how Nebuchadnezzar came and burnt the city of Jerusalem. About how he destroyed the temple of God because of the idolatry of the people. But it was more than that. I tell you, it was more than that. And how do I know it? What's that old song? How do I know? The Bible tells me so, right? <laughs> oh, God, I need to get that song out and learn that one. Do that one for the memory care unit. They'd love it. How do I know? The Bible tells me so. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 22, beginning in verse 23, Ezekiel, one who sees the destruction of the temple from Israel. God had to move him miraculously there because he was in the diaspora, but God showed it to him. Not sure how he did that. Maybe one of these days I'll get to be transported too. I don't know. But this is the word that came to Ezekiel, Ezekiel 22, verse 23. The word of Adonai came to me saying, Son of man, say to her, to Israel, You are a land that is not cleansed or raid upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in her midst. Like roaring lions tearing prey, they have devoured lives. They take wealth and valuables. They multiply widows in her midst. Her koanim, her priests, have done violence to my word, my teachings, my Torah, and have profaned my holy things. They have made no distinction between the holy and the profane, nor have they taught the difference between clean and unclean. They have shut my eye, their eyes to my Sabbaths, my Sabbathot. And so I am profaned among them. So he's nailed prophets. He's nailed the priests. Now he's going after the king and the princes. Her princes in her midst are like wolves tearing a prey, spilling blood, destroying lives for dishonest gain. Her prophets have plastered them with whitewash, seeing false visions, predicting lies to them, saying, Thus says Adonai Elohim, when Adonai has not spoken. The prophets devoured souls. They took people's money and they turned women into widows. How did they do that? By giving false prophecies. By telling men they could go out to this war and survive and win. And they'd go out and get killed. That was one way. The priests didn't even teach the commandments of God anymore. And the rulers, the judges, the princes, because they were supposed to be the judges, were dishonest thieves and murderers, and the prophets tried to make them look good. Does this sound familiar yet? 
Yeah. I want us to get that connection. I want us to know that we have prophets that are prophesying wonderful things. Wonderful things are coming. God is going to bless us. Really? There's going to be a great revival. Maybe, but at what cost? Just skipping a part there. The priests, the preachers, they don't even make a distinction between what is God's word and what is not God's word. They're profaning the Torah. They, they profane the law of God. They tell people, keep on sinning. It's okay. God loves you just the way you are. They forget the last statement, which is, and he loves you too much to let you stay that way. Come on. <laughs> They ignore the Sabbaths. Have you ever tried to explain Sabbath to a preacher that doesn't get it? It doesn't work. Don't bother. <laughs> I will tell you right now. It's not worth the fight. Until God opens their eyes, it's just flat not worth the fight. I mean, I can explain it all I want. But God has to open their eyes. Now, he may use some of the things that we say. But what churches are honoring Sabbath today? Even if... Given. Even if Sabbath were changed to Sunday, who's honoring it? Who actually takes a day off? Who actually rests? Who actually gives the whole day to God? And I'm not even going to begin to talk about our government structures and our judgment halls and our unjust justice system. And yet, it comes back to one more thing. Okay? It's not just them. You've got to understand that. Not just all leadership. Verse 29. The people of the land have oppressively blackmailed, plundered, and robbery, wronged the poor and the needy, and abused the outsider unjustly. Now, I'm going to step on some toes here. People might get mad at me. That's not unusual. That's why you took your shoes off. Maybe that is why I took my shoes off. Wronged the poor and the needy and abused the outsider unjustly. I'm looking at our nation. And I'm looking at the way that immigrants are being maligned and mistreated. Whether they're here legally or not is not the issue to me. The issue to me is are we treating the poor well? No, we're not. We're blaming the poor. We blame them for their own problems, right? It's all their own fault anyway, so and 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 I just I've gotten to the point I, I, I got a whole bunch of memes. Do you know what a meme is? A meme is a, a picture that has a pithy phrase put on it to make a point, right? And I started downloading what I called mean memes so that I could write about it because I'm getting, I was sick and tired of how mean we are to people. That person that is standing on the corner with a sign that says, I'm hungry, is a human being. They are a person that God created. They are somebody's son. They are somebody's daughter. And we, and Christians are among the worst. We abuse them. The people And we no longer see people as people. We see them as outsiders, as other. We see them as criminals. We see them as whatever we choose to call them. And, and, and I'm trying not to label it with just one group, but, but I'm going to tell you something, and, and I know people won't like this one either. Not all Muslims are mean. <laughs> They're not. They're not. We have some phenomenal people in our community who are Muslim, 
who work up at the hospital, and by the way, they save your lives. And they are not going to participate in a jihad. But we malign all Muslims as if all of them are the same. We malign all as if, and that's just one group. Okay? That's just one group. Am I saying not to be cautious, not to be aware? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we need to be very careful because as bad as our leadership is, guess what? It's in the people too. These are what God told Ezekiel were the reasons he was judging Jerusalem. But he doesn't stop there. Verse 30. I searched for someone among them who would build up the wall. Now, this is not talking about a wall to keep people out. Okay, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the wall of the temple. He's talking about that place for coming to give honor and sacrifice to him. I looked for someone who would build up the wall, stand in the breach before me for the land so that I would not destroy it. The saddest verses, I think, the saddest words in the Bible. I found no one. Therefore, I learned in Bible college that if you see a therefore, look and see what it's there for. Look at the verses before because it's there for a reason. So what's it there for? Therefore, it's because I couldn't find somebody to stand in the gap and to plead with me. It's because I couldn't find intercessors. It's because I couldn't find people who would do justice. It's because I couldn't find any prophets that would speak my word without getting slaughtered. I mean, he found Ezekiel, Jeremiah. There were a few, but they were few and far between, and the people maligned them. It's because my priests, my preachers, my pastors, they're not taking care of people. They're taking advantage of people. It's because prophets are lying, saying this is a word of God when it's not. Because of these things, all of them, judgment. I poured out my fury on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. I have brought their own way upon their heads. It's a declaration of Adonai. In other words, I've given them what they've been giving out. You know, they had the words of the prophets, the true prophets. God had tried to reach his people. In fact, God had even sent Isaiah to several kings, not one. Did you know that? Isaiah 1, 1, he says, The vision of Isaiah, son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now, we're talking Judah and Jerusalem, not the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom have already gone. So they already have an example of what's going to happen if they don't turn. And then Isaiah, it says, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. He goes through four kings trying to get one of them to submit to God in full. Just one could have changed everything. The instructions were very, very clear. Isaiah 1, 16. Wash and make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your deeds, for my eyes cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Relieve the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. This is the law. This is Torah. This is it. It's in those things. Then he says, come, let us reason together. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. They, they be red like crimson. They will be like wool. We love to quote that verse, but we don't get the next part, which says, if you are willing and obey, 
you will eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured with the sword. The mouth of the Lord has spoken it. We love the concept about our sins being a scarlet. As, you know, our sins becoming white like snow. We're going to be like fresh water. But if we don't obey, that's not going to work. Am I teaching salvation dependent upon works? No, I'm teaching salvation results in works. When we turn and we turn towards God, then he will begin to teach us to do good, to seek justice, to relieve the oppressed, to defend the orphan, plead for them. If we're not doing those things, my question is, do we know God? The famous story of, of the of the house of Hillel and the house of Shemai, the house where where a a Greek went to them, each of them individually went to the house of Shemai and said, "Teach me Torah while I stand here on one foot and I'll convert." And the house and Shemai chased him out with whips. Excuse me, I, you are ludicrous. You can't do that. You know I can't teach you Torah while you stand there on one foot. Torah is too much. Goes to the house of Hillel. Okay, I will convert. I, I will believe in your God if you can teach me Torah while I stand here on foot. One foot, and Hillel says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is the whole of Torah. The rest is commentary. Go and learn it. Go and learn it. If we're not learning it, <laughs> do good. Come and reason. The people did not hear. The kings did not hear. The sword came against them. The prophet Joel also sent warnings. <laughs> he was from the northern kingdom. They'd already been carried off, kept, set captive, but he sent them word also in Joel chapter 2. Blow the shofar in Zion, it's starting with verse 15. Sanctify a fast, proclaim an assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even those nursing at breasts. Let the bridegroom come out from his bedroom, the bride from her chamber. In other words, this is so important, I don't care what you're doing, you've got to come. Between the porch and the altar, let the Kohanim, the ministers of Adonai, weep, and let them say, have pity, Adonai, on your people. Don't make your heritage a scorn among the nations so that the people say, where is their God? Then Adonai will be zealous for his land and have compassion on his people. Joel said, here's what you got to do. It's really simple. Come together, fast and pray and beg God for forgiveness. They didn't do it. Will we? Will we? Because we are the priests today, right? We are the priests for our people. We are the priests for our city, our country, our state, our nation. We are the priests today. Will we do it? Changes need to take place, and it isn't in government. If it doesn't start with people, with us, it will not happen. We must be willing to stand in the gap, to build a hedge of prayer, to weep before God, to ask him for pity, to ask him for forgiveness, and to ask him to send others to join us. You know, some people hear this type of message and they go, well, I really don't even know how to pray. Yeah, you do. It's called talk. It's called talk to God. Oh, well, I, I, I do that, but I don't know how to intercede. I don't know how to stand in the gap. I don't know how to, what's it look like to be between the porch and the altar? What does it look like to step between the people and the sacrifice? It's really pretty simple. We're taught how. The Apostle Paul even wrote out very clear instructions in 1 Timothy 2. He 
he commands. Now Paul is writing to Timothy. Timothy, he is setting in charge over a congregation of a city. He's, he's training Timothy to be the leader there. And he tells him, Therefore, first of all, I urge that requests, prayers, intercessions, thanksgiving be made on behalf of all people, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may live a peaceful, quiet, not peaceful and quiet life in all godliness and respectfulness. This is good and pleasing in the sight of the Savior. He desires all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. That's what God desires. Requests. I urge that requests be made. Okay, request is like a basic prayer. It's an earnest request. The, the word actually, a better translation, could almost be begging. I urge you to beg God. Beg. Intense request. Please. Then it says intercessions. That means to argue for or against something, actually, if you go to the Greek. We can almost say, for intercession, it's almost like being a, a defender. You're an attorney and you're defending someone. You're arguing for them. You're arguing for them. We already have an accuser. That's Satan. He's arguing against us. So Paul is saying, argue for them before God. And then it says, with thanksgiving. In other words, we need to be grateful. For all people. I don't care who the president is, we're supposed to be grateful. And offer thanksgiving. And we're supposed to pray for them. I don't care who the governor of the state is. I don't care whether you like her or not. We're supposed to pray for her. Beg God for his blessing. Argue in favor of her receiving the word of God. And be thankful for who she is. That God has created her and put her in that place. I don't care if you like her or not. It doesn't matter. This is what God wants. It says, this is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. People who say, I don't know what God's will for me is. I say, well, open your Bible and read it. This is God's will that we pray for people. Are you doing that? If we're not doing that, how do we expect him to give us the next step? If we're not doing what he's told us, how do we expect him to tell us what to do next? We can't get to what we do next until we do what God's already told us to do. In fact, I will tell you, tomorrow night we're going to talk about how I hear the voice of God. And we're talking about, we're going to discuss what are things that we do that stop the voice of God in our lives. And I'm going to tell you one of the number one things that will stop the voice of God is disobedience. Have you done the last thing he told you to do? If not, why not? If it's too late. Repent. I have good news for you. You can repent. You can come back and you can say, I am so sorry, God. Forgive me. And guess what? He will. But I tell you, too, when he gives you the next step, obey. Right? I believe that it's a time for us to do this. I believe that we are on the edge of, as, a, as a nation, as a people. Even as the world goes, as the world turns, so they say, right? If you see what's happening in Jerusalem over Temple Mount, you got to know something's going on. If you look ahead to the solar eclipse that is going to take place right across the states. Now, I, I posted something on our Facebook page that was a link to uh, Mark Biltz out of... Out of um, El Shaddai Ministries, and he talks about the eclipse going across and what day is it going to take place? It's going to take place on the first of Elul. What is the first of Elul? It is the first of the month of preparation for Rosh Hashanah. What is Rosh Hashanah? The king's coronation. So here we have this solar eclipse going across, right across the United States. 
right at the beginning of the time to prepare for the crowning of the king. And I'm going, what is this saying to us? Are we going to crown him? Or are we going to have judgment? God's been speaking through prophets, through pastors, through teachers. We are called to change. We are called to seek justice. We're called to stop evil practices. We're called to bring relief to the oppressed. Those are all necessary. But before we can do any of those things, we have to pray. Because you can start doing for God, but if you don't have the prayer life, if you don't have that support, you're going to find yourself in trouble. The doing is first. The doing is the result of the praying. Because, you know, we can't meet every single need in this community. We can't. So we have to ask. We have to be among those who will come and agree and cry out for God's mercy and search for a spirit of repentance and cry out for that. We must be the priests because God has called us to be. We have to offer our sacrifices of prayer, sharing the truth of his word, whether people like it or not. I have been asked, well, what does the ninth of Av have to do with Christians anyway? Because we're Christians. Okay, great. Cool. I love it. You follow Messiah Yeshua, the Christ. Great. The word Christian means a little Christ. It means like him. All right? So are you going to be like him? Well, first of all, understand that the history of the ninth of Av begins with the sin of the spies. The 12 men went out, they spied Canaan, they came back with a negative report. The people believed the negative report and God punished them. Traditionally, the night after the spies brought back the bad report, that began the ninth of Av and the people spent it weeping and wailing because of their misfortune. We're right on the edge of the promised land and we can't go in. Throughout centuries, a remarkable number of misfortunes have befallen Jerusalem and the Jerusalem Jewish people. Interestingly enough, many of them happening on the ninth of Av. We've talked about it a little bit. The two most notable events, the destruction of Solomon's temple by the Babylonians, and 600 years later, more than little more than that, the destruction of the temple, second temple by the Romans in 70 AD. 500,000 Jews were slaughtered by the Romans in the city of Bithar at the culmination of the Bar Kokhba rebellion on the ninth of Av. The temple of area was plowed under by the Roman general one year later on the 9th of Av. By the way, um, this is also when the Jews were expelled from England in 1290 and from Spain in 1492. You know, a lot of things happened in 1492. Why did Columbus leave Spain? Because he was Jewish. He was. <laughs> wasn't just coming to find a new country. He had to get out of Spain. Of course, he pretended to have converted in order to get the blessing of the queen. But the final solution of Nazi Germany, by the way, was approved in a closed-door meeting. They've traced it back to this date. That ultimately led to the murder of six million Jews. The expulsion of the Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto began on this day. Crusades, there's significant events about the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, the Holocaust. A lot of these things happen in and around the 9th of Av. The custom in Judaism is to observe the day as a fast day, similar in stringent to Yom Kippur. From sundown the night before to sundown tonight, no food or water is consumed, no bathing or washing. No leather shoes are worn. Much of the day is spent sitting on low stools. We've talked about that a little bit or on the ground reading passages like Lamentations, reading Jeremiah, reading Isaiah, mourning the destruction of the temple. And what does this have to do with Christians? The book of Ezekiel talks about a vision that God gave him in chapter 9 where he called a man with an inkhorn to go through the midst of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sighed and cried over the abominations that were done within Jerusalem. Then God commanded his soldiers to go through the city, beginning at the temple, and kill anyone who did not have the mark on his forehead. It's not always about whether or not you're marked. 
I mean, it's not always the mark of the beast that you're worried about. Do I have the mark of God? Right. If you've got the mark of God, you don't have to worry about the other, <laughs> okay? Because of the abominations, the idol worship, the sins of the people and the temple, God's justice had to be enacted. Only those who sighed and cried over Jerusalem, those who mourned the sins and wrongdoing, were the ones who were be being saved. In the Gospel of Matthew, just before he died, Matthew 23, I'm going to go ahead and open to that. Before he is arrested, as he is coming up to Jerusalem, before that beautiful week, verse 37, he's looking out over. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left too desolate. And I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Baruch Hababa Shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. If our Messiah wept over Jerusalem, should we not also? Besides, how many of those horrible things that have happened to the Jewish people have happened because of the Christians? Should we not repent for that? Should we not mourn the sins of our fathers? Should we not mourn the fact that we didn't just bring justice, but we went over and above and beyond what God's justice should have been? Should we not denounce the replacement theology that says, oh, God's done with the Jewish people. It's all about the church now. Excuse me, God's not done with his people. That's the type of teaching, that's the type of thing that has led to their destruction, that has led to the killings, that has led to all of that. It's that type of teaching, that type of thought. Hitler thought he was a good Christian. He was just following the teachings of Martin Luther. Took him to an extreme. That was how he presented it at the beginning. Should we not mourn for that? Should we not be counted among those who sigh and weep for Jerusalem on the ninth of Av? See, I want his mark on me. I want to be one who has the mark of God. God has promised that this day will turn into a day of rejoicing. He has promised that. Zechariah chapter 8. I love Zechariah. Again, the word of Adonai Zevot came saying, this is Adonai Zevot, the fast of the fourth, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth month will become joy, gladness, and cheerful moedim, cheerful gatherings. Those, all four of those fasts were related to, to Jerusalem and the temple. The killing of a good prince who was maligned is one of them. These are all in result of judgment. They saw all four of these have to do with what caught them into the diaspora, the first one. But God says he's going to change that. The days are coming. The days are coming. The days are coming when we can take off the morning. is coming when we take off the sackcloth. And what causes the sin to be taken care of? What causes it all to be kept? Our sins are as scarlet, but the blood of the Lamb, the blood of the Lamb cleanses us, right? Amen. To the white. When we are cleansed,
His word is renewed to us again. And then we can rejoice. Then we can have dancing. Then we can praise. Then we can be happy. The day's coming. But until then, are we doing our part to bring that about? That's my challenge to you tonight. And I know it's a heavy challenge. I wasn't going to do this one. I had this whole, a whole other thing I wanted to do. Nice and happy and God's going to change. Thanks, Lord. And I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. You know? You know what that means? That means you guys already get it. Or you wouldn't be here. You already get it to a degree or you wouldn't be here. But there must be more that we need to get. Or he wouldn't have thrown this at me and said, okay, here you go. Okay. God is going to shift it. Our mourning will be turned to dancing. We will be able to rejoice with God. But we're not there yet. Just look around you. We're not there yet. We're still in a season where we need to walk humbly. We need to be humble with God. We need to to be obedient to him. Let's go ahead and finish with the song um, House of Jacob, Walk in the Light. Because that's what we need to do. Right? It's a challenge to walk in the light of God. And it's how we're going to end. And then we're going to break bread. <laughs> Walking alone.